Open your Bibles with me again to the book of Philippians at chapter number 2. I want to commence reading at verse number 12 through verse 18. Philippians at chapter 2, commencing in verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Verse 18 reads, For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. Thank you. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. I want to talk this morning about the, the work, the walk, and the witness of the Christian life. The work, the walk, and the witness of the Christian life. Everyone in here this morning has to meet certain expectations as we go through life. Our parents had certain expectations of us. And we as, we as children have certain expectations of our parents. Spouses have certain expectations. Husband ex, husbands expect certain things from their wives. Wives, of course, expect certain things, all things, everything, every day, every minute, every hour, sometimes impossible things from their husbands. Employers expect their employees to come to work on time. Employees expect to get paid for their work. Members have expectations of their pastor. And pastors have expectations of their members. However, when you get right down to it, the expectations we hold over one another are really nothing more than holding people to a particular standard. In so much as that holds true for us, for one another, did you not know that God has standards that he expects of his people? Philippians is written to a good church. It's a happy church. It's a giving church. As a matter of fact, Paul is writing in one way to commend them for their gift that they are sending to him by Epaphroditus. Paul is in prison and this church was founded and pastored by Paul some 10 years ago and now their pastor founder is in prison and they send Epaphroditus to check on Paul and, and to report to Paul how they are getting along but there's also something going on in that church that Paul needs to address. There's some murmuring. There's some 
disputing going on. They are arguing with one another. And Paul says to them, if you're going to be followers of Christ, there's got to be unity in the fellowship. There cannot be disunity in the church and then show a united front to the world. Verses 1 through verse 4 is a plea for humility. Verses 5 through verse number 11 that I talked about last Sunday is a pattern for humility. And the verses under consideration this morning, verses 12 through 18, is the process whereby we can become more Christ-like in our daily lives. I want you to look with me first, brothers and sisters, in verses 12 and 13, which deals with the expectation of the Christian's work. The expectation of the Christian's work. The Christian faith, Lily Grove, stands on two solid foundations. Trust and obey. James, in his book, calls it faith and works. Paul is not uh, diffident about putting under the same roof Arminianism and Calvinism. To move that illustration a little further, uh, Paul is not embarrassed to talk about salvation as divine sovereignty and human free agency. Our salvation is all of God, but we have some participation in it as well. Let me see if I can make that make sense. When Jesus went to that wedding feast in Cana of Galilee, he turned water into wine, but they had to go get the water pots. Somebody ought to help me preach it. When Mary and Martha told Jesus that Lazarus was sick and he delayed coming and he finally got there and he raised Lazarus from the dead, he did in fact raise Lazarus from the dead, but they had to roll the stone away. Uh, when they were out there in the desert place and there was no food for them to eat and uh, Jesus said, give them something to eat, they said, we have a little boy here with two fish and five loaves. They had to bring it to Jesus. Somebody ought to help me preach it. We are saved when we place our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Our salvation buries the past, changes the present, and ensures the future. God planned it. God purposed it. God pursued it. God paid for it. And God pressed it upon our hearts. But salvation begun is not salvation completed. We are told in verse number 12 to work out your own salvation. Now if God has already saved me, why do I have to work out my own salvation? Let's discuss, Lily Grove, what that verse does not mean. It does not mean work to be saved. Jesus took care of that on the cross. It does not mean to work out an inward salvation. By inward salvation, I mean don't listen to the lie that there's some spark of divinity in you and all you need is to fan the flame and it will become a fire. Ephesians chapter 2 said, you who were dead in trespasses and sins, God has quickened you, God has made you alive and you were dead, spiritually dead. Anybody who comes to Christ who is lost doesn't have a little salvation in them. They are totally lost. Totally depraved. There's no way I can waken my spirit to God unless God first quickens me. I wish I had a witness here. You didn't come to God. God came and found you. 
the very grace you needed, the very faith you needed had to come from God. Salvation is all God. It does not mean work to stay saved. Because if I can't work to be saved, I sure can't work to stay saved. Are y'all listening to me? That word fear and trembling is not a slavish fear of hell, but it is trembling anxiety that what God has deposited in me, I don't mess it up. I don't fear going to hell because when I put my trust in Jesus Christ, he transferred me from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. I am not going to hell. I already know that because he said, who I hold in the palm of my hand, the devil can't pluck him out. I am sealed until the day of redemption, but I don't want, I don't want my work to be an embarrassment. Paul said, my greatest fear, I wish I had a Bible reading is that when I have preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. I have helped others to gain a prize that I'm disqualified for myself. All this preaching, all this singing, all this teaching, all this praying that you and I are doing is not for salvation. It's from salvation. We don't work to be saved and we don't work to stay saved. So what does it mean? What does it mean to work out your own salvation? It means to complete it. To carry it to its conclusion. He's talking about moving deeper in the things of the Lord and growing in spiritual maturity. It's a picture of a mine, of, of mining, of mining for gold and mining for diamonds. God has put these minerals, gold and diamonds in the earth and men have to mine them out. It's expensive, it's hard work, but the results are worth the effort and the expense. When you are saved, God put all of him within you. Day by day, you are to work to see that your salvation is mined to its fullest. There's some gold in you that the Holy Spirit wants to get out. You are a diamond in the rough, but the Holy Spirit has got to get it out to make sure that there are no impurities in the minerals. And sometimes he uses a furnace, the furnace of affliction. I wish I had a witness here. Sometimes he uses sickness. Sometimes he uses the loss of a loved one. Sometimes he uses some physical malady. But whatever God has to do to make us like Jesus, I am thine, O oh Lord. I've heard your voice. And it told you love to me. And I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and my will be lost in thine. With fear and trembling is the fear of putting our trust in ourselves. It is the fear of taking heed lest you fall. It is a constant apprehension of the deceitfulness of your own heart and of the insidiousness and the power of inner corruption. 
left by yourself, you'll never be all God wants you to be. Are y'all listening to me? Look at verse number 13. Verse 13 says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now that word work is in verse 12, but it is also in verse 13. Same word, two different tenses and voices. In verse number 12, it is the present imperative. In verse 13, it is the present infinitive. In verse number 12, work means not work for salvation, but it means a command to a continuous, repeated action for something that has already been done in the past. God has already saved you, so how you work for your own salvation is empowered from verse 13. You can't work on your own salvation unless it is God who works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Before we are saved, listen to this, before we are saved, God worked on us. But now that we are saved, God is working in us. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Um, listen, justification and glorification is all God the Father and God the Son. Justification and glorification is God the Father and God the Son. But sanctification is the work of God the Holy Spirit with my cooperation. Let me say that one more time. I, I like that. I worked a long time on that. Justification and glorification is the work of God the Father and God the Son. But sanctification is the work of God the Holy Spirit with my cooperation. So salvation is Father, Son, Holy Spirit with my cooperation. And I don't work to stay saved. I work because I've been saved. Um, it's, 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 it's something like this. I shared with the brothers in the back. Uh, my first car, my daddy went with me to Musa, Pontiac, Cadillac, and Buick on 2nd Street in Eunice, Louisiana. And my daddy signed for it. I drove it off the showroom floor, after my daddy signed for it. But my daddy said, son, this is not my car, this is your car. You got to keep it clean. You got to see to it that the oil is changed. Tires rotated. Make sure that it's balanced. Make sure that the windshield wipers are always working. Make sure that you pay your own insurance. It's your car. And I love that car. I, believe it or not, I changed my own oil. Can you believe that? A, a lazy trash like me. I changed my own oil. I washed that car every week. I made sure that the tires were rotated and balanced. I made sure that the windshield wipers were always working. I paid my own insurance because my daddy said, that's your car. He signed for it, but told me, you got to take care of it. He signed for it. But he said, it's not mine, it's yours. And you got to take, he signed for it. But I had to take care of it. One Friday, on a hill called Calvary, he signed for it. But he said, you got to take care of it. It's your salvation. You got to get up on Sunday and go to church. You got to read the scripture. You got to study the Bible. You got to pray. You got to sing in the choir. You got to usher. You got to work out your own salvation. No 
Nobody ought to be more interested in your salvation than you. I wish I had somebody to help me here. Nobody should have to beg you to do God's work. Nobody should have to assign you to do something for the Lord. You ought to do it just because God saved you. He didn't have to save you. And he didn't save you to sit on a pew. I must work the works of him that sent me. I wish I had a Bible reader. While it is day for the night is coming when no man can work. Work out your own salvation. Do something at church. Besides say amen. Besides shout and scream. No, do something in the kingdom. I'm not, I'm not talking about show up at church because you can get anybody to show up at church. No, no, church got to show up in you. And how church shows up in you is when you leave here, you go do what you heard me say. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's the work that's expected of the Christian. But then in verses 14 and 15, the expectation is now of the Christian's walk. Paul has told us how we ought to work. Now here is how we ought to walk. We ought to walk in obedience to God. Look at that verse. Look at, look at verse 14 with me. Do all things without murmuring. 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 Nobody in the world can murmur like black Christians. And if anybody ought to be shouting, it ought to be black Christians. We have nothing to murmur about. As a matter of fact, no Christian has anything to murmur about because everything we have comes from God. Listen to me. Murmuring, without murmuring. That word murmur means a secret displeasure in the heart that's not been publicly revealed. It's a secret displeasure in your heart that's not been publicly revealed. You talk about it on Facebook and on the phone and in the parking lot and in the Sunday school class and to your children and to your neighbors. I can tell the members here who don't like me because your children don't like me. I know the parents who love the pastor because their children just grab my leg and hold on to me and run up to me and jump in my arms because they hear nice things about their preacher from their parents. You teach your children how to treat you when you get old. Because if all you do is murmur and dispute and complain and have secret displeasure in your heart that's not been publicly revealed, let me tell you what will happen to you. It's right in the text. When you read the Old Testament, it was murmuring and disputing that kept Israel in the wilderness 40 years. A journey that could have taken two weeks ended up taking 40 years because all they did was murmur and dispute. For 400 years, they asked God to send a deliverer. And God sent them Moses, and Moses is delivering them. And they say, how come you took us out of Egypt? We had onions and garlic, uh, tofu and rice dressing. Uh, we, we had leeks. We had pomegranates. 
Uh, we, 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 we were poor, but we was eating. Now they cried, God send us a deliverer, and all they did was complain. And one day they were complaining so much that God let snakes bite them. And many of them died. A whole generation died in the wilderness because they murmured and complained. And maybe the reason you are going around in circles is because you are murmuring and complaining. We ought to walk in obedience to God. Then in the second place, we ought to walk in opposition to the world. We are called to be blameless. That word blameless does not mean you have no blame. It's free from fault. Free from defect. And harmless means you are unmixed. You have no pretense. You are not a hypocrite. People should be able to look at your life and mine and even if they disagree with us, they should not be able to point out any hypocrisy in our lives. They don't agree with our faith. They don't agree with us going to church. But at least they agree that we are consistent in what they don't like about us. Let me see if I can make that make sense. And I say this to the preachers all the time. I say this to the brothers here all the time. The only thing I respect about Donald Trump, the only thing, the only thing, the only thing, the only thing that I respect about Donald Trump is he never misrepresented himself. He's been a fool since day one. And he's never tried to be anything but a fool. So I don't know why people get surprised when he says foolish things because he's been saying that ever since he started running. He's never misrepresented himself. He's never been a hypocrite. Somebody ought to help me talk here. And people ought to be able to look at your life and mine and see years of consistent walking in obedience to God but opposition to the world. Long as you've been walking with God, there are some things the world ought not be able to make you do. Be not conformed. Have I got a Bible reader? to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've been walking with God all these years and you're still mad with people? You've been singing in the choir all these years and still ain't speaking to people? You've been coming to church all these years and still walking in disobedience? You have not grown. You have not matured. You have, Sunday school ain't doing you no good. Preaching ain't doing you no good if you're in the same place 10 years later that you were in 10 years ago. Some things ought not matter to you anymore. The more you walk with God, the stronger your walk ought to get. Have I got a witness here? Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. The more you love God, the more you ought to love God because walking with God is a de obedience one day at a time. But here's the good news in that. Even when we sin in trying to obey, he loves us so much that he doesn't scold us. He dusts us off put us on our feet again and let us get back and try all over. And there needs to be somebody here who can help me testify that I have fallen so many times and in so many ways but he didn't scold me, he just dusted me off, put me back on my feet and said preach boy, teach girl, sing your song, pray your prayer because God who loves us sent Jesus to die for us 
that we don't have to stay in our sin. That's the, that's the expectation of the work. That's the expectation of the walk. But unless I hold you too long, there's an expectation that we ought to be a witness. It's right here at the end of verse 15 and verse 16 and forward. It says that we may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Christian, you ought to shine. And you ought to shine in two ways. Want to know what they are? Come on, pay me, I'll tell you what they are. You shine, first of all, as a light reflector. You are not the light. You are the reflection of the light. Somebody gonna help me here in a minute. The moon has no light of its own. The only way we see the moon is the light is reflected from the sun. And if the earth gets in the way, you can't see the moon at all. But if the earth moves, it's a crescent moon or a half moon. But if it's all the way out the way, it's a full moon. And if you let sin get in the way, you can't see God at all. But keep coming to church and you'll be a crescent Christian. You'll be a half Christian. And before you know it, you'll be a whole Christian. Because you are not the light, you are a reflection of it. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, but don't give you the glory. Glorify the Father who is in heaven. We shine as light reflectors. But then secondly, we shine as lighthouses. You know what a lighthouse is? When it's cloudy, when it's foggy, and ships are trying to make it to the harbor, if they could just see that lighthouse, they know that soon they will have safe landing. Some people are stumbling in darkness right here in this neighborhood, right here in this city, right in your own family. So why don't you just be a lighthouse? And when they want to come to a safe harbor, they can come to you because your light is shining and they see Jesus in you. I want my daughter to see Jesus in me. I want my granddaughter to see Jesus in me. I want my brothers, my sisters, my nieces, my nephews, my cousins, my friends, my members to see Jesus in me. And know that I am not the light. I'm just a reflection. Don't put no trust in me. Don't follow me 24 hours a day. No, no, follow God, follow Jesus, and follow me as I follow Jesus. I'm, I'm, I've never, since I've been pastor of this church, I've never been a hypocrite. I'm a fool, but I'm not a hypocrite. I, I want him to write that on my tombstone. He was not a hypocrite. Crazy, but he was not a hypocrite. What you see is what you get. I've told you over and over and over and over, you are looking at the most low down of sinners. Who is preaching to you this morning is the worst crook in the city of Houston. But I have a treasure. 
but it's housed in an earthen vessel. And the reason why the treasure is in this vessel is because the excellency of the power might be of God and not Terry Anderson. So you can go away from here saying he ain't no good, but he sure can preach. He's a sinner, he's a crook, he ain't, no, he ain't right, but thank God he's got a treasure and that's what people ought to be able to say about you. You have a treasure in an earthen vessel. You are light reflectors and you are lighthouses. Christians ought, first of all, to shine. But as I hurry, Christians ought not just shine. That same verse tells us Christians ought to share. Verse 16 says, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yes, sir. Brothers and sisters, we ought to take the faith that we have and share it with somebody else. I'm trying to quit here now, but listen to me. Simon Peter, who Jesus used mightily, was a great torch for Jesus Christ. He was a great torch, a fire that could be seen even some 2,000 years later. Simon Peter was a torch that was on fire for Jesus Christ. But Simon never would have caught fire if Andrew didn't strike the match. We never would have heard of Simon Peter had it not been for Andrew. Andrew struck the match that started Peter's fire. Dwight L. Moody, one of the greatest preachers who ever lived, Moody Bible Institute in Chicago is a shrine to his ministry. But he never would have been anything without hearing Billy Sunday. A nobody. Nobody would, would even know him if he walked in the room. But he influenced Dwight L. Moody. You will never know nor hear of John Wilkerson. But my pastor preached the gospel and I got saved. And I am in Lily Grove this morning, a place he never would have dreamed of coming. But I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. And your life this morning is where your life is this morning because of some unnamed person in your background. Some great, great grandfather or grandmother that you never knew who planted the seed of the gospel in your grandmother. And then your grandmother planted that seed in your mother. And your mother planted that seed. Listen, Paul said to Timothy, stir up the gift. I wish I had a witness. Stir up the gift that's in you. I know it's in you because it was in your grandmother. It was in your mother. Somebody planted it in you. And you are in here this morning because somebody planted it in you. And so now, pass it on. Tell your children your story. Tell your grandchildren your story. It hadn't always been the way it is right now. This house you're living in, we didn't always live like this. This car you're riding in, we didn't always live like this. I tell it to my daughter often, that, that, that car my daddy signed for, I couldn't park it where I had to back it up because the transmission was gone. I had to park it straight so I didn't have to back up. And then if I left it idling too long, I had to jump in it because it just take off by itself. But I thank God for it. I changed the oil in it. I changed the windshield wiper blades. I rotated the tires. It, 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 it wasn't worth that much, but it was mine. Because my daddy signed for it. And I took care of it until I could do better. Are y'all listening to me? My car was raggedy until I could do better. It, it wasn't much, but I had it. It was mine. 
and I thank my daddy for providing it for me. And I took care of it like it was something. Because listen, you don't appreciate what you don't work for. You have no appreciation for a salvation that you don't put any effort in. That's why you don't shout. That's why you don't praise God. That's why you don't lift your hands in the sanctuary. Because your salvation ain't worth much to you. But the, for those of us who know that if God had not saved us, we'd be somewhere in jail right now. We'd be dead and in our grave. If God had not gone to the trouble to look for us, we wouldn't be who or where we are right now. And since God has invested that much in you, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure.